Number five on this list is Thomas de Torquemada. This is a name that is often forgotten. Thomas isn't often talked about in the same conversations as some of the other people on this list. He didn't kill as many people as some of the other people here, but don't think for a second he wasn't as evil. Had he the means to do so, he assuredly would have killed far more people than he did, and he still killed a ton. Next Luxury writes, The first Grand Inquisitor, Thomas de Torquemada, was a religious zealot. Like many in Spain during the 14th century, he believed Catholicism was the one true religion and anyone who disagreed had to be punished. The Spanish Inquisition was established to help combat heresy, but actually helped solidify those in power who ruled through fear and violence. De Torquemada was one of the nastiest members of the Spanish Inquisition who used brutal torture methods to get confessions from prisoners. He was also responsible for burning thousands of non-believers at the stake. It wasn't even enough for you to convert to Catholicism, this guy would still come after you even if you did. If he thought you converted because of fear or some other reason he deemed unfit, then he'd force you to wear certain garments and torture you. Heretics would get waterboarded and then often killed afterwards. He sought the expulsion of over 40,000 Jews from Spain as well. He kicked them out, only allowing them to leave with what they could carry, having to abandon their homes and their livelihoods. On top of this, he killed thousands thousands of people too. This guy was absolutely messed up and would do anything in his power to keep Catholicism alive in Spain. I guarantee that if you lived in Spain during the 1500s, then this guy would definitely have been haunting your dreams. Number three on this list is Idi Amin. Idi Amin was a horrible individual who was brutal in every sense of the word. He overthrew the government in Uganda in 1971 and was in power there until 1979 when he was finally ousted. During his time in power, he showed the world just how horrifically evil he was. History.com says, Once in power, Amin began mass executions upon the Akoli and Lango Christian tribes that had been loyal to Obote and therefore perceived as a threat. He also began terrorizing the general public through the various internal security forces he organized, such as the State Research Bureau and Public Safety Unity, whose main purpose was to eliminate those who opposed his regime. In 1972, Amin expelled Uganda's Asian population, which numbered between 50 and and 70,000, resulting in a collapse of the economy as manufacturing, agriculture, and commerce came to a screeching halt without the appropriate resources to support them. Throughout his oppressive rule, Amin was estimated to have been responsible for the deaths of roughly 300,000 civilians. One of the worst parts about all of this is that he never had to pay for these heinous acts. After he was ousted in 1979, he fled to Saudi Arabia and just lived out the rest of his life there under protection. He lived comfortably there after having caused so much pain and death just years prior. He lived like this for decades until he finally died in 2003 from natural causes. Idi Amin doesn't get nearly as much media coverage as he should. The atrocities that took place in Uganda during the 70s need to be talked about more and must be acknowledged. Millions of people during that time would have been living in total fear of this man. I think it's fair to assume he probably still haunts the dreams of those who had to live through this terrible tragedy. Trauma. Number two on this list is Joseph Stalin. Stalin is another one of those guys who just has to be on this list. His name is synonymous with evil and hatred and death. Next Luxury says, Much like Hitler, Joseph Stalin was loved by his supporters and hated by everyone else. The dictator governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. His communist identity was influenced by Marxism-Leninism, resulting in his own idea known as Stalinism. Throughout his rule, millions died, particularly during the famine of 1932 and 1933, thanks to his disruption of the economy. Stalin was also responsible for the Great Purge, where a further 1 million were imprisoned and around 700,000 executed. To this day, Stalin supporters revere him as a champion of the working class, looking past the ethnic cleansing and mass executions that happened during his time in power. Stalin's horrifying exploits are often overlooked because just a little further down the line, you do have the whole Adolf Hitler thing. Stalin was right up there though as being just as brutal. The way he treated the Ukrainian people was absolutely horrific. He starved them for the sake of starving them. We cannot have another one of these individuals in our world ever again. We barely made it out the first time that we had one. Number five on this list is Mao Zedong. 
Mao Zedong wanted China to become a superpower, but how he went about it wasn't the best. Loss of life to Mao Zedong really wasn't of much importance to him as long as the end goal was achieved. The BBC writes, Mao and other communist leaders set out to reshape Chinese society. Industry came under state ownership and China's farmers began to be organized into collectives. All opposition was ruthlessly suppressed. The Chinese initially received significant help from the Soviet Union, but relations soon began to cool. In 1958, in an attempt to introduce a more Chinese form of communism, Mao launched the Great Leap Forward. This aimed at mass mobilization of labor to improve agricultural and industrial production. The result, instead, was a massive decline in agricultural output which, together with poor harvests, led to famine and the death of millions. The policy was abandoned and Mao's position weakened. In an attempt to reassert his authority, Mao launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966, aiming to purge the country of impure elements and revive the revolutionary spirit. One and a half million people died and much of the country's cultural heritage was destroyed. In September 1967, with many cities on the verge of anarchy, Mao sent in the army to restore order. It was in this great leap forward that Mao's rule cost the lives of millions. He wanted to change China into an industrialized nation and implemented tons of unproven agricultural methods. This dropped the food output significantly and led to the Great Chinese Famine. This famine is largely regarded as the deadliest man-made disaster in human history, so yeah, it was pretty bad. Unlike others on this list, Mao for the most part wasn't infatuated with the deaths of citizens, it was just a byproduct of his incompetency and horrible rule. Granted, we can't let him off too easily because he also didn't care that much to change his way of thinking. During his reign of power, it's estimated that 40 to 70 million Chinese civilians died through forced labor, executions, or famine. Number 4 on this list is Nero. We're throwing it way back with this one and going to the year 37 AD. That's when Nero was born and he lived until 68 AD. Only just over 30 years of life, but he did enough during that time to earn himself a spot on this list. Wikipedia writes, Most Roman sources offer overwhelmingly negative assessments of his personality and reign. The historian Tacitus claims the Roman people thought him compulsive and corrupt. Suetonius tells that many Romans believe that the Great Fire of Rome was instigated by Nero to clear land for his planned Golden House. Tacitus claims that Nero seized Christians as scapegoats for the fire and had them burned alive, seemingly motivated not by public justice but by personal cruelty. This personal cruelty of his is widely documented and nobody was safe from it. One would think that your own mother would be on the do not kill list, but apparently not for Nero. To rid himself of any potential outside influences, he had his own mother murdered. He said to have stabbed, burned, boiled, impaled people for his own personal pleasure. Couple this with the fact that he said to have burned down entire cities while people are still inside of them, and you get a horrible tyrannical dictator who I'm sad to report actually did exist. Number 3 on this list is Pol Pot. Wikipedia writes, Pol Pot was a Cambodian revolutionary and politician who governed Cambodia as Prime Minister of Democratic Kapucha between 1976 and 1979. Ideologically a Marxist, Leninist and a Khmer nationalist, he was a leading member of Cambodia's communist movement, the Chmer Rouge, from 1963 until 1997 and served as the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Kampucha from 1963 to 1981. Under his administration, Cambodia was converted into a one-party communist state and went through the events of the Cambodian Genocide. The Cambodian Genocide is something that we don't learn about enough in history class. This genocide claimed the lives of at least 1.5 million Cambodian civilians from 1975 to 1979. 1.5 million is already a ridiculously large number, but it should also be noted that in 1975, this would have accounted for roughly a quarter of the entire country. Pol Pot and the party that he led during this time wanted to turn Cambodia into an agrarian socialist republic. At the time, Mao Zedong was in charge of China and Pol Pot went to him for advice on how to make this a reality. To do this, he emptied out cities and forced people into labor camps where they were either executed or simply worked to death. 
Disease and malnutrition was also rampant in these camps and the quality of life was horrible. Money was abolished and everybody was forced to wear the exact same black clothing stripping people of any sense of their individuality. This truly was a horrible time in Cambodian history and saw so many atrocities committed countrywide. It finally ended when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia in 1979 and Pol Pot's government fell. He lived for roughly another 20 years though, finally dying in 1998. Number 2 on this list is Joseph Stalin. Ekharsh Merota writes, Joseph Stalin was dictator of the Soviet Union from 1922 till his death in 1953. As a young man, he was a robber and an assassin. For almost 30 years, he reigned with terror and violence in the Soviet Union. His decisions led to a famine that killed millions. Forget enemies, he even killed families of people who were fond of him. Under his rule, more than 1.5 million German women were assaulted and in all, he easily killed over 20 million people. He once said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. Ironically, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1945 and 1948, and he died of a stroke in 1953. That famine that I just mentioned frankly does not get talked about nearly enough. Wikipedia writes, The Holodomor, also known as the Terror Famine or the Great Famine, was a famine in Soviet Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 that killed millions of Ukrainians. It was a large part of the wider Soviet famine of 1932-1933. The term Holodomor emphasizes the famine's man-made and allegedly intentional aspects such as rejection of outside aid, confiscation of all household foodstuffs, and restriction of population movement. As part of the wider Soviet famine of 1932-1933, which affected the major grain producing areas of the country, millions of inhabitants of Ukraine, the majority of whom were ethnic Ukrainians, died of starvation in a peacetime catastrophe unprecedented in the history of Ukraine. Since 2006, this has been recognized by Ukrainians and 15 other countries as a genocide of the Ukrainian people carried out by the Soviet government. This was a famine that could have been prevented or dealt with, but just wasn't. It was actually intentional. There are reports of survivors who said that soldiers would come to their homes and specifically destroy any food that they had there for no reason. Stalin truly was void of emotion, and it's sad that a man like this actually existed. Number 5. Robert Fisher Robert Fisher was a man living in Arizona with his wife and two children, living quietly. He had worked as a surgical technician and had previously attempted to become a Navy SEAL. He was an avid outdoorsman, an expert hunter, angler, and camper, and found himself frustrated that his children didn't quite share this love of the outdoors with him. Fisher did all he could to present himself as an all-American, white picket fence, nuclear family man, but the truth was far more complicated than that. A child of divorce, Fisher had intense issues regarding separation. He and his wife fought constantly over everything, and reports from friends say that he was cruel, controlling, and manipulative to her during their marriage, refusing to let her decorate the house how she wanted, berating her constantly, and so forth. As well, he didn't socialize much outside of his family, and was described as a loner. In late 2001, his wife Mary Fisher had had enough, and after nearly 20 years of marriage, was planning on filing for a divorce. On April 9th, 2001, neighbors would overhear a loud argument from the Fisher property. Later that night, the property would explode, burst into flames. Firefighters found inside the property the bodies of Mary Fisher alongside the Fisher son and daughter. Mary had been shot and the other victims slashed. Robert Fisher himself was not recovered at the site. Robert was thought to have set off the explosion in his own home intentionally as a way of burying his evidence and his tracks, and is thought to have fled entirely, hoping to begin again under a new identity. The thought process from police being, he was terrified of Mary leaving him and afraid of repeating the childhood trauma of his mother's divorce. He saw fit to end the lives of his family rather than put them through that experience. Now, friends of Fisher had noted that there had actually been a pattern of worry behavior before this. Allegedly, on one hunting trip after successfully bagging an elk, Fisher took the blood from the exit wound and smeared it all over his face. Another occasion describes him sneaking up on a family at a picnic to scare them by firing off shotgun rounds into the air, or an altercation in which he fatally 
a neighborhood dog for attacking his dog, although the police had suspected there was foul play. Fisher was never found, and police aren't even sure if he's still alive. One detective working the case said, maybe this is all we'll ever get. Maybe this is the best we've got, knowing he did it and never finding him again. And my ghouls and goblins, if it's scary stuff you're looking for, Top 5 Scary has got to be one of the top 5 best places to watch scary videos. Ghosts, cryptids, real crimes, aliens, we got it all. Take a look through the cursed archives and see where it takes you. Now let's keep going. Number 4. Richard Lynn Bear Richard Lynn Bear is an interesting exception on this list, as he's the only one of these fugitives who actually was caught. Now the problem with this is that he was not caught for very long. It didn't really take, as he escaped from jail shortly after being apprehended. Richard was wanted for the death of Sherry Hart, a divorcee and young mother who was waiting for a date on January 15th, 1984. Her date had stood her up, and she changed her evening plans to go out and have fun with high school friends Jeffrey Burgess and one Richard Lynn Bear. However, the evening would take an extremely dark turn, when Bear would make an advance at Sherry Hart. She rebuked him, and infuriated and incensed, Richard bashed her with the butt of a handgun, and ordered that Burgess drive them about an hour and a half away into the woods. Lynn Bear then dumped Sherry out of the vehicle in the woods, leaving her bleeding heavily. Burgess had told police he'd acted under the threat of his life. As Bear had told him, he would see to it that Burgess died if he said anything about what had happened that night. However, Burgess was more than willing to cooperate with the police, leading them to finding Hart's remains and arresting both Bear and Burgess for the crime. However, Burgess would escape days before being tried from the small town county jail, where he fled, adding him to the FBI's most wanted list for his crimes and unlawful flight to avoid persecution. As of this recording, the trail had gone completely cold, and Lynn Bear was never found again and is still wanted. Burgess passed away at the age of 46, having spent most of his life in and out of prison on various unrelated charges. Number 3. Bradford Bishop until I can prove that he's dead, I'm going to assume he's still alive. That's the words of Montgomery County Sheriff Raymond Knight, speaking on our next entry, Bradford Bishop. This notorious criminal has been on the FBI's most wanted list for years, and has managed to elude capture this entire time. In fact, he was taken off of the FBI's most wanted list in late 2018 to accommodate more serious fugitives, and FBI had some reason to believe he might not even still be alive. Bradford Bishop was an unusual case. As he was a fairly promising career man with no stains on his record. He was working as a counterintelligence official, a former army serviceman, and he worked as a diplomat. Life seemed to be going fairly well for Mr. Bishop, who fathered three children with his wife Annette, where they lived in Bethesda, Maryland. On March 1st, 1976, Bradford was passed over for a promotion at work that he was due for. He left the office a little bit early, telling his secretary he wasn't feeling well that day. He would then drive to his bank, he withdrew a large amount of money, and he went to fill up gas in his car and then to a hardware store to purchase a shovel, pitchfork, and a sledgehammer. Bradford would then return home and ended the lives of his family members one by one. He would carry their bodies into the trunk of his car, where he drove them deep into the swamp nearly 300 miles away, where he buried and lit the bodies ablaze in a shallow grave, burning the remains of his once happy family. There would be a few sightings of Bradford afterwards. He was last seen buying tennis shoes with an unknown woman and a dog March 2nd. On March 18th, his car was discovered by police at an isolated campground all the way over in Tennessee. See. The contents of the car were unnerving. A blood soaked blanket, a shotgun, an axe, and the well for the spare tire was soaked in blood. A jury indicted Bradford, and that was the last time any evidence of the case ever emerged. Now, since then, there have been numerous unproven sightings, sporadically appearing throughout Europe mostly, but nothing that has contributed to an arrest. If Bradford Bishop is still alive, he is 86 and has still evaded capture. Number 2 The Freeway Phantom. The Freeway Phantom was the self-given nickname of a serial criminal around Washington, D.C. who has never been identified. He first made himself known in the early 1970s, seemingly taking a page out of the Zodiac's coded, puzzling handbook. The Freeway Phantom taunted the police with cryptic messages and puzzles teasing his capture. 18-year-old Brenda Denise Woodard was found dead in November 1971 with a note inside one of her coat pockets. The note read out as follows. This is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Signed, The Freeway Phantom. The name happened to catch on, 
And there are a few criminals who offer to write their own monikers, but clearly the Freeway Phantom had a brand in mind. Over the course of a 17 month period, six similarly aged young black women were found all along the highway, all missing their shoes and all showing visible signs of trauma. Police had been working on what they thought had been promising leads, including an investigation into two former police officers who were being convicted of a separate crime. However, none of these investigations ever turned up anything concrete, leading the FBI to take charge of the case in 1974. However, it was around this time that the trail started to go cold, and no more deaths following the Freeway Phantom's MO appeared, luckily. Although tragically for the victims' families, no justice would ever be found either. The investigation is still active in some aspects in Washington DC, although given that it's been 5 decades since the first victim was found, it's hard to think that any serious progress might be made on this case. Perhaps the identity of the Freeway Phantom will never come to light, but at the very least, it seems as if the brutal series of crimes had stopped. Number 1. The Vending Machine When you were younger, did you ever hear about the urban legend of someone putting poison in candy or someone putting a razor blade inside of a chocolate or an apple or something and giving it out to trick or treaters? Probably have. I mean, I've even talked about it before in a previous video on urban legends. It's the kind of story that you'd hear on a playground and it would scare you and stick with you for life. You tell yourself that kind of thing only happens in the movies and no one in their right mind would ever go around poisoning unsuspecting people. But that's perhaps because you've never heard of this case. The case of the mysterious vending machine criminal in Japan. This wave started in April of 1985. People around western Japan, primarily in Tokyo, were dying under mysterious circumstances. The first victim died shortly after purchasing two bottles of a popular Japanese soda or a ramen C. In the next coming weeks, there were 35 cases of mysterious poisonings all tracked back to Oranomen C purchased at vending machines. At the time of the crime spree, the company producing Oranomen C had been running a promotion where their vending machines would give out a second bottle of the product after purchasing one. And the criminal took advantage of this fact, lacing bottles of the soft drink with a powerful poison. And he placed them inside or on top of the vending machines to deceive consumers into believing that they'd been a winner of the promotion and they got that extra second bottle. Shortly after, police issued citywide warnings across all vending machines to inspect each drink carefully to see if the seal on the bottle cap had been tampered. Of these 35 cases, 12 of them were fatal, making the Oranaman C tampering the deadliest product tampering case in history. Police had absolutely zero leads and the nature of the crime made it incredibly difficult to track down, as the bottles had been dispersed seemingly randomly across western Japan. As well, there did not appear to be any greater motive, no intentional victims, there was nothing to link them together, as the victims that had all been afflicted had been completely random. Police had suggested though that they think the suspect was a single agent acting alone, who had meticulously planned the crime. A psychologist suggested possibly that the crime was carried out as a response to Japan's orderly and aggressive work culture, and that this was a lashing out by hurting unsuspecting people that the victim would never have to face. They would get a sense of rush and control, but never have to directly deal with the consequences. Whoever was behind the Oranaman C tampering spree was never caught. There were cases across Tokyo afterwards police suspected might have been copycats, but no leads and no arrests were ever made. Coming in at number 5, Michael Taylor. It's 1974, Yorkshire, England. Michael Taylor, age 31, father of five and husband to Christine Taylor. Michael was a well-mannered and caring father and husband. Michael, like anyone, became depressed from a back injury, left him short on work and seeming a little odd and off. After seeking religious advice and a one-on-one -on -one session at a local church, Michael started having outbursts and acting aggressively. Puzzled, he seeked one-on-one -on -one sessions which turned ugly. After apparently changing form and attacking Marie, a young religious leader helping Taylor and unable to remember anything, Michael and the church agreed that an exorcism was necessary. Father Peter Vincent and Reverend Raymond Smith met at St. Thomas and started. It got so violent, he was tied to the church floor. After hours in the middle of the night, the two had managed to exorcise more than 40 demons out of Michael, in which appeared around them as they exited. Violence continued, leaving only three demons remaining for the next day. After returning home from the first session, Michael was found now only hours later, naked, in the middle of the street, covered head to toe in blood. Michael had returned home, to which then his wife and family dog lay dead as the police arrived in the AM. His wife, missing her eyes, tongue, and skin from the front of her skull. The dog, torn limb from limb and spread around the home. He was arrested soon after for the death of his wife. Michael had this to say about his late wife in court, quote, I am released. I am released. It is done. The evil in her has been destroyed. 
Yeah, that was definitely a vessel for him. He was acquitted on psychological conditions and jury found that he met his breaking point during the exorcism that night. He was acquitted on insanity and remained in and out of facilities until he passed in 2013. Number four, David Berkowitz. New York, 1976, and the police were busy on the search for a man shooting couples in the New York area, which had started to become a citywide phenomenon that summer. Brunette women with long hair frantically cut and dyed their hair blonde in fear. The 44 caliber killer was the title the press gave David in his earliest of assaults. After losing his job, David began to experience psychotic episodes and claimed that his neighbor's German shepherd had begun talking to him and eventually explained to David that he was a demon. He took the name after the pet's owner, Sam. It was this dog who ordered the killings by David and claims that the pet coaxed David into killing. David used this summer to shoot eight people, resulting in six lives and the stabbings of two others. Using his 44 caliber bulldog revolver, David sent police on a wild goose chase around New York City with handwritten letters, David mocking the detectives with cryptic messages. Some of them explain who Sam is and some of them explain what Sam does. Some mock police saying that they are never going to find or stop him. David was finally arrested just hours before his next planned victim's visit. He applauded police in their ability to stop him in the back seat of the car, laughing and cheering. Although David pleaded not guilty to insanity and pleaded guilty, expressing that he was coaxed by the demon and that it demanded him to kill for hell. He was sentenced to six consecutive life sentences with parole after 25 years. During the mid 90s, he amended his confession and claimed that he had been a member of a violent satanic cult that orchestrated the incidents as a ritual murder and pleaded guilty to stabbing and attempting to murder others before the shootings had even begun. His letters are public and spine chilling. Check them out. Real Riddler stuff. Quote, I am the monster. I am Beelzebub. I am the chubby behemoth. Police, let me haunt you with this. I'll be back. I'll be back. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Okay, his violent spree led the legal system to create a new law called Son of Sam's Law, designed to create criminals from financially profiting from the publicity created by their crimes, which at the time, he was basically a celebrity. He remains in prison to this day. Number three, Herbert Mullen, 1970s again. At the exact same time, in the same area, police had two serial killers to keep up with, Herbert Mullen and Edmund Kemper. No relationship to each other or each other's cases. Mullen was a paranoid schizophrenic in and out of mental health facilities in California during his teens. Mullen then kills 14 people during a four month period due to quote, the impending natural disaster that would happen if he didn't. Mullen was convinced that the voice in his head he was hearing was telepathic. Mullen claims the voice of the father had explained that the Vietnam War acted as a giant sacrifice that saved us from an earthquake and another one was coming soon. Constantly hearing the man's voice named the father, encouraging him to gain more blood sacrifices, Mullen bludgeoned a man to death with a baseball bat. Mullen claims that the man was actually Jonah from the Bible and was begging him to sacrifice himself to Mullen. He then murdered a woman in the front seat of his car before dismembering her in a nearby park. Yeah, this is real satanic stuff, I told you. His third victim, a priest that he was confessing to in a Catholic church. Mullen says the priest claims to have telepathically begged him to sacrifice his life for the cause. Mullen then killed five people in one day. He claims that all the victims telepathically begged to be sacrificed as a good deed to the father. Herbert Mullen remains in custody. And who was the father who kept talking to him through all of these people? Number two, Richard Ramirez. This next guy is really nasty and deserves to be in the second spot. 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 assault, and 14 burglaries. Sounds like a hell of a guy. The Night Stalker. Charming name for what this man did. Born in Texas, his older brother went to Vietnam and returned with some pretty gruesome stories and some pretty gruesome visuals. The young Ramirez soaking all of this up grows up obsessed with the satanic occult and fascinated. He made various references to Satan during his legal proceedings. His trial began in 1989 and he was convicted of 13 murders and a variety of other crimes. Nearly two months later, he was sentenced to death with a judge stating that his crimes showed quote, cruelty, callousness, and viciousness beyond any human understanding. And the worst part was that he made most of his victims pray to Satan and swear on Satan that they were gonna tell him the truth, whatever he asked. I'm not really gonna get into the sick details of really what this man did, nor will I with the number one spot, but it involved hammers, machetes, ropes, knives, guns, you name it, anything violent. He was an absolute nasty creature that liked to torture his victims and really drive the satanic love for you know who. First responders would have taken pictures of numerous satanic symbols drawn on the walls in almost a ritualistic reenactment. He was captured by the use of the huge media surrounding his story on the way 
to take his next victim's life. His trial was truly a disgusting display of media attention, one of the most expensive court cases to date, losing only to O.J. Simpson. He screamed Hail Satan at his hearing and flashed self-harm pentagrams. He died of cancer in 2013. This guy must have signed some sort of book for you know who. Coming in at number one, Charles Manson. Okay, so most of us are all familiar with this man and his famous case amongst American pop culture. Ramirez was said to have been a copycat of this man, and I can see why with all the satanic Yes. California in the late 1960s, a criminal, musician, and a victim of LSD studies, Charles Manson would go on to start and lead the Manson family cult. A small religious group with unclear motives, but lost souls and a ton of drugs, and a father to now a family. In summer 1969, some of the cult members committed murders in LA. Apparently Manson had ordered his followers to kill the people who had lived at the address he had given them for their initiation. The murder of actress Sharon Tate and four others in her home on August 8th and 9th, including the La Biancas the next day. Another two victims. Four members of the family committed the murders under Manson's instructions and satanic offering. Manson apparently heard voices that there was going to be a race war brought on by religious disputes and that these killings were an offering to who exactly? The famous Helter Skelter message, incoherent scribbles, blood all over the walls. They were then to hide underground in quote, the bottomless pit under Death Valley, which Manson knew the location of, but instead were caught on the run days later. Manson was sentenced to life in prison under the pretense that he was the one who targeted, planned, and brainwashed his quote, piggies into committing. While in prison, Charles was diagnosed with schizophrenia and paranoid delusion disorders, seeing visions and hearing voices for more than half of his life. He died in prison in 2017. Yeah, I've seen what Tarantino did with his latest movie and it's definitely a subtle PG-13 fiction version of what actually went down on that night. What do you guys think? Do you think Charles saw the devil? I think he actually was the devil. Number five, Randy Greenewalt and Gary Tyson. As a two for one bonus for our viewers, our first entry on this list details the imprisonment, escape, and brutal rampage of two prisoners from the Florence State Prison in Arizona, USA. In 1974, Randy Greenewalt and his brother James were held on suspicion for the murder of a truck driver named Stanley Sandage. The brothers had shot the driver and taken his wallet before being arrested when they tried to purchase stereo equipment with the victim's credit card. The authorities realized that the killing was extremely similar to the death of another driver, Henry Weber, four days earlier. The two brothers were charged with the murders, but Randy was able to avoid the death penalty by testifying against his brother. He was sent to Florence State Prison where he met Gary Tyson. Tyson had attempted to escape several times and was serving a life sentence for stabbing a prison guard. The two men formed a plan together to try and escape with the help of Tyson's three sons, who showed up to visiting day with a concealed shotgun and helped the two prisoners to overpower the guards and escape with plans of escaping to a ranch in Mexico. They quickly ran into trouble when their car blew a tire. A kind stranger driving with his wife, infant son, and teenage niece came across them and tried to see if they needed help. They were taken prisoner by the convicts and taken into the desert where they were shot and left for dead, while well, Greenewalt and the Tysons fled in the family's Mazda. They made contact with a woman Greenewalt had become pen pals with, who bought them a truck and ammunition, plans of making their way to an airplane that Gary had chartered for their escape. The police caught wind of this, and the gang was forced to try and make alternate arrangements. They made their way to Texas, where they killed a couple of new newlyweds and took their car. Days later, they were met with a roadblock, which they ruthlessly barreled their way through, before being met with another one six miles down the road. The officers opened fire on the gang, hitting one of the Tyson sons who was driving. The remaining two brothers and Greenewalt were captured, but Gary Tyson got away, although he was found dead in the desert 11 days later, having died a slow death of exposure to the elements. The brothers were sentenced to life in prison, and Gary was executed by lethal injection after spending two days decades on death row. Number four, Lida Southard, the Black Widow. While not all marriages end well, and some can accurately be described as unmitigated disasters, few have ended as poorly as the various marriages of Lida Southard. But for all her faults, no one can say she didn't take the vow of tell death do us part seriously. Lida married her first husband, Robert Dooley, in the year 1912. For a while, it seemed a good match, with Dooley's brother Edward joining them on their ranch in Twin Falls, Idaho 
in the couple having a daughter named Lorraine two years later. When she was a year old, Lorraine suddenly died, having apparently drunk tainted water from a dirty well. Tragedy struck again later that year, when Edward died of food poisoning. Two months after that, Robert died of typhoid fever, and Lida was left the only surviving family member. Fortunately for her, she had taken out life insurance policies on each of her family members, and had over $4,500 to try and start over after this tragedy. She soon married William G. McCaffell, becoming the stepmother to his three-year-old daughter. When his daughter fell ill and died, the couple decided to move to Montana together. But within a year, William died of influenza, leaving poor Lida a widow once again. Bad luck seemed to follow her wherever she went, with her next husbands, Harlan C. Lewis and Edward F. Meyer, both dying of sudden illnesses within four months of marrying Lida. A relative of her first husband started to notice the pattern and had his family's corpses exhumed and examined, proving that all had died of arsenic poisoning. The other bodies showed the same results when tested, and Lida was arrested before she had a chance to murder her fifth husband, Paul Southhard, for the insurance money. She was sentenced to 10 years to life in the old Idaho State Penitentiary, where she remained as a model prisoner for the next 10 years. The guards eventually stopped watching her as closely as they should have, and in 1931 she managed to remove a bar from her prison window and use her bedsheets to construct a rope in order to escape. She remained at large for over a year until she was found in Topeka, Kansas, married to her sixth husband, Harry Whitlock. She was taken into custody for another 10 years before being released in 1941. She died of a heart attack in 1958, whereupon her seventh husband, Hal Shaw, likely breathed an unconscious sigh of relief. Number 3. Nikolai Zumagaliev, the Metal Fang Nikolai was born in 1952 in the Soviet Union. He went to railway school before being conscripted into the Soviet Army. After his service ended, he tried to go to university or become a driver, but failed at both. He worked various odd jobs, including that of a sailor, a forwarder, an electrician, a bulldozer operator, and a firefighter. He spent a lot of this time fantasizing about and planning murders, committing his first in 1979 on a woman he had encountered traveling across a rural path. He committed five more murders that year, whose victims he then cannibalized, and may have committed more if not for the fact that one night he got extremely drunk and accidentally shot one of his co-workers. He was arrested, diagnosed with schizophrenia, and sent to a mental institution. He was released less than a year later and he resumed his murders, committing two more. His ninth murder is what resulted in him being captured, as he had invited guests over to his home. He brought one of the guests into a different room, killed them, and began dismembering them with an axe. The other guests walked in on this and fled the scene before calling the police. They came to get him, but were so shocked at the sight of him that he managed to escape before being captured the next day. He was declared insane and incarcerated in a mental hospital where he remained for the next eight years. In 1989, while being transferred to a different hospital, he managed to hijack the vehicle and escape. He was able to avoid capture for two years, killing at least one more person while at large, before he allowed himself to be caught stealing sheep. His hope was that he would not be recognized and could go to jail for a relatively minor offense. The story he gave the officers didn't add up, and a colonel familiar with the case was sent to check the situation out. He identified Nikolai, and he was sent back to a mental hospital where he remains to to this day. Number 2. Ted Bundy The most well-known of the monsters on this list, Ted Bundy was a cold-hearted murderer who would feign injury in order to get close to women and then attack them into unconsciousness in order to take them to a secondary location where he would take advantage of them before strangling them to death. He would often return to the bodies of the victims where he would subject the corpses to further indignities for decomposition made this impossible. He later confessed to 30 murders, but the authorities believe his real body count is likely extremely larger. In one of the first examples of computers being used to investigate serial killer crimes, authorities compiled all the information they had, based on witness statements, to come up with likely suspects, and the computer produced a list of 26 names, one of them Bundy's. At the same time, detectives made a list manually of their 100 best suspects. When Bundy's name appeared on both lists, he became their number one suspect, but word came out that he had already been arrested. A highway patrol officer had seen Bundy cruising a residential area and fleeing upon seeing the police car. When searched, they found a crowbar, handcuffs, a ski mask, 
mask, rope, and an ice pick, among other suspicious items in Bundy's car. He was soon linked to and found guilty in a kidnapping case until the authorities gathered more evidence to charge him with the murders. In Utah State Prison, he attempted an escape and was placed in solitary confinement for several weeks before being transferred to Garfield County Jail. He was then taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse, where he chose to act as his own attorney. This allowed him to avoid having to wear handcuffs and shackles, and during a court recess he was allowed into the court library to research his case, where he snuck away from his guards and fled through the library window. He made his way to an Aspen hunting cabin, which he broke into and stole food and a rifle from. He became lost in the mountains and eventually found his way back to Aspen, where he stole a car but was soon apprehended by authorities. He was sent back to prison where he acquired a hacksaw blade and spent six months sawing a hole in the bars in his window. He squeezed through the gap and into the crawl space, which led to the chief jailer's apartment where he stole clothes and walked right out the front door. During the two months of freedom following his second escape, Bundy managed to kill two sorority girls and one 12 year old girl before eventually being arrested for driving a stolen car near the Alabama state line and being sent back to prison where he remained until his eventual execution. Number one. Earl Nelson. When Earl Nelson was two years old, his parents died and he was sent to live with his grandmother and her two younger children. Even from his young childhood days, he exhibited self-loathing and morbid behavior, being expelled from his primary school as a seven-year-old. He got even worse after being hit by a streetcar and being knocked out for almost a week. Upon awakening, he began to suffer from intense headaches and memory loss, and his behavior became more and more erratic. He was in and out of prison as a young adult for relatively minor charges such as trespassing and larceny. He eventually ended up in Los Angeles County Jail, where he remained for five months before escaping and joining the Navy. He was committed to the Napa State Mental Hospital by a Navy psychologist who described him as living in a constitutional psychotic state. The doctors at the institution described him as suffering from hallucinations and paranoid delusions, but they deemed him relatively harmless. In his time at the hospital, he managed to escape three times, causing the staff to nickname him Houdini and eventually stopped searching for him. He was sent back to the hospital after trying to assault a minor, but escaped two more times before eventually being discharged in 1925. The next year, he began his string of murders. He would travel the country, pretending to be a harmless traveling Christian, looking for women with rooms to rent. He would then be invited into the women's homes, whereupon he would assault and murder them by strangling them. Not always in that order. A witness who saw him near the scene of the crime described him as a dark and stocky man with long arms and large hands, causing the newspapers to begin calling Earl Nelson the Gorilla Man, or the Dark Strangler. He managed to cross the country, killing at least 16 women, as well as two of their children, before making his way to Canada to avoid the growing manhunt. While in the country, he killed two more people before authorities were able to track him down and arrest him at a nearby train station. He escaped from the prison that very same night and boarded a train going south back into the States. The train happened to be carrying several members of the local police force who recaptured him and took him back to prison. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Although he tried to appeal this for reasons of insanity, he was hanged in Winnipeg in early 1928 at the age of 30 years old after killing at least 23 people and having a escaped incarceration on seven separate occasions. Number five, Grigory Rasputin. Grigory Rasputin, the mad monk of Russia, was a mystical healer who wandered Russia in the early 20th century. Now I could do a plot summary of what Rasputin got up to, but honestly Boney M did a better job than I ever will, so just all tab out of this video real quick, listen to that song, come on back. Okay. Did you? Well, if you didn't, the quick rundown is that the black monk genuinely believed himself to be a holy healer with otherworldly powers, and was appointed a lofty position by Tsarina Alexandra to heal the young prince of his hemophilia. He was rumored to be part of a secret order called Klisti, connected with all sorts of scandalous practices. Now, no official connection was ever made to Rasputin and the sect. Rumors of the man still persisted. He carried an infamous reputation around the country, with stories of his wild debauchery and black magic, stories of wild powers. Did he really? have otherworldly powers? Given his infamous nigh immortality, I am a bit inclined to agree with him. The man simply could not be put down without serious effort. There was a plot to have him enticed by a courtesan and castrated until he caught wind of it. In 1914, he was in the chest by a beggar and shrugged it off like it was nothing. Now, of course, the most famous story of Rasputin was his assassination at the hands of the Tsar's cousin and a handful of noblemen. As the famous legend goes, he was poisoned, bludgeoned, and drowned, and still that wasn't enough until he passed later in the day. Was Rasputin just Russia's toughest customer, built different? Or did he have some sort of mystical help from another world? We may never know. Hey, are we having fun with the channel, my little freaks and creeps? Stay subscribed for more scary content every single day. Number four, Vlad the Impaler. 
You know, with a title like Vlad the Impaler, it's safe to assume that the guy was probably up to no good, demon or no demon. Perhaps you've heard the legend that Vlad Tepes was the inspiration for Count Dracula, which should tell you even more if you want to judge of this guy's moral character. Vlad was a prince of Wallachia, an area that's now known as modern Romania. Vlad grew up in a very dark period of Wallachian history, coming up while the Ottoman Empire was setting its sights on just about everything good in Eastern Europe. Vlad was made king of Wallachia, but first he was deposed and exiled after an assassination plot on his brother and father. He would reclaim the throne in 1458 and quickly began a campaign of bloodlust to show the world he was not someone you should be messing with. One of his most infamous acts, and where the dubious title comes from, was after fending off an Ottoman invasion, he impaled 20,000 soldiers and left them as a grim forest of the damned. And some legends say he would eat dinner in front of this. Downright demonic behavior. There's some debate as to whether or not he really is the inspiration for Dracula, although of note is that beside his infamous sobriquet Vlad the Impaler, he went by the nickname Vlad Dracul, owning from his father's position in the Order of the Dragon, which translated to Dracul. There are also stories of Vlad washing his hands with the blood of his enemies, which I'm gonna be honest, that kinda sounds like something Dracula would do. It's worth noting too, no one really knows what happened to Vlad's body. We know that he was slain in battle, and that he was eventually put down after years of carnage, but his body or grave has never been found. Perhaps it's because it's still walking or flapping. Whatever a bat does. Number three, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper is one of history's most infamous criminals, and honestly, maybe the most. Over 130 years ago, and we are still absolutely fascinated by his crimes, and we still don't even know for certain who he was. Could still be out there, he could still be at large. He terrorized Whitechapel through the year of 1888, leaving behind a series of sickeningly grisly crime scenes, torn apart and left in the street for all to see. There are at least five confirmed cases that are attributed to Jack the Ripper, but there are several more that are speculated to be attached to him, with some suggesting that it could be anywhere from 13 or higher. Jack eluded capture, stupefied his pursuers, and taunted his would-be captors, sending the police souvenirs, I guess, from his crimes, wrapping in the mail and sending them out. On one occasion, he did this alongside a threatening letter, boldly claiming to be from hell, known as the from hell letter. The jeering letter taunted the police, inviting them to catch him, while he described the pleasure he took in his sick, sordid dealings. Investigators were downright stumped trying to find the guy. They suspected he didn't have any level of medical training, as his hurried slashes led them to believe he could have been a butcher. The way he slashed his victims was beyond horrific. He left them missing, missing and in some cases beyond recognition. It seemed too like he could be in multiple places at once. A body discovered in New York a few years after the crime spree matched the victims of Whitechapel almost perfectly. Was it a human performing all these sickening acts? Or could the Ripper's mangling be attributed to a demon that was preying on the women of White Castle? It would explain how he was so elusive and managed to evade capture for all those years. Number five, the Servant Girl Annihilator. I can't believe I just said those words. The Servant Girl Annihilator. I I can't believe that's the real name newspapers went with to call this guy. I know not everyone's gonna be able to get a nickname like Jack the Ripper, but you can't go around calling criminals stuff like the Servant Girl Annihilator. You're just gonna inflate their ego. You're making him sound like he's a Dark Souls boss, or he's gonna be jumping in the ring against Hulk Hogan and the Iron Sheik. Anyway, sorry, I had to get this out of the way before we could talk about it. I, I feel like we just had to address this name. We couldn't just look at that and move on. And you know the wildest part? He doesn't even have the craziest name on this list. Okay, let's get into it. The Servant Girl Annihilator was the nickname of a brutal night stalker who preyed on the streets of Austin, Texas in 1885, a full three years before Jack the Ripper would stalk Whitechapel and steal all the fame and fortune in the attacking women at night community. Despite his name, he actually didn't exclusively target women. Unlike his British counterpart, Mr. the Ripper, the SVGA attacked men and women, although he mostly focused his attention on women, and they were all servant girls, which is where the name came from. He ended up slaying seven women and one man, and critically injured six women and two men on top of that. All of his victims carried out the same way, attacking them whilst they slept in their beds and then dragging them out into the streets when he was finished with them, usually with a sharp object such as a knife or a needle sticking out of the ear. There was a wild manhunt for the Annihilator, and it's said that in 1885, some 400 men were questioned and interrogated about the identity of the Annihilator. Elected officials apparently refused to believe that it could be the work of one lone psycho, thinking there was a group of men committing these crimes together for Lord knows 
why. While several men would end up being questioned, no one was ever successfully linked to these brutal crimes. He was never caught, but an increased presence by sheriff's department and citizens forming an armed militia to protect the streets were enough to scare off whoever was doing it into fleeing the area. And eventually, the crime stopped. So where did he go? That's the question, because he was never found. And there are some who even wonder if perhaps maybe he bought himself a train ticket and found his way to Whitechapel to continue his spree. And my friends, if you're looking for more true crime stories, more rumors, whispers, conspiracies, cryptids, aliens, video games, movies, and whatever else we got, Top 5 Scary has it all. Number 4, Bible John. Everyone on this list has a weird nickname. Everybody. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm just going to spoil that for you. Coming up next on this list is going to be Bible John, who's got a name that is deceptively unassuming. Bible John was an infamous executioner who preyed on women in Glasgow in the late 60s. All of his victims he met at a popular nightclub, the Barrel and Ballroom. He operated for a few years and is confirmed to be connected to at least three cases and maybe more. He was subject to one of Scotland's most extensive manhunts. He was the first time a composite sketch in the country was ever used as the front page of the newspaper. All because there were so few details about the case or just who he was. What few tidbits of trivia and information we have on Bible John, his crimes, his motives, and his modus operandus come from one of the victim's sisters, who very briefly shared a taxi with Bible John and her sister sister on the night of her death. Her very brief witness, it was only a 20 minute trip, was all the information they had to provide investigators to form a psychological profile of him aiding in the investigation. Now, the name Bible John would stem from his practice of obsessively quoting the Bible and ranting and raving about adultery to his victims before, well, you know. The statement we have with Gene Puddock states that in the short period of time they spent together, he was making nigh constant and frequent references to specific Bible passages and really hammering home how much he hated adulterous women. He preyed on brunette women who all looked fairly similar and found them all at the same nightclub, charming them and then attacking them. Their bodies would later be found naked in the streets with signs of strangulation. The only witness, one Jean Puddock, passed away in 2010. With no more leads and the case having been on ice for nearly 50 years, it's very unlikely Bible John will ever be found anytime soon if he's still out there. Number three, the doodler. Next on all this list is the doodler. Like everybody else, don't let the goofy name fool you into thinking there is anything silly or funny about this guy. Now this bizarre nickname would come about from his habit of drawing pictures of his victims before he would attack them. And I guess the drawer or the sketcher or the artist didn't quite roll off the tongue the same way that the doodler did, and that's the name they went with. The exact body count of the doodler is unknown, but police believe that it could be anywhere from 6 to 14 victims total in San Francisco, stretching from 1974 to 1975. Several men disappeared from the city's gay community and more were injured. And part of what made him so hard to identify is that despite the city's historically very liberal and accepting view of the LGBTQ plus community, at the time the larger mainstream whole community hadn't quite got there yet. And so several of the men who would end up surviving an attack were too worried about outing themselves to want to cooperate with the police, leading to very few victims cooperating with the police, meaning there was very little information for any of them to work with. and the criminal was able to successfully elude pursuit. Ironically, for someone named a doodler, the composite face sketch they had from witnesses is the only real bit of evidence they ever had to work with. However, unlike a lot of the other cases on this list, this one is actually still actively ongoing. There's a $200,000 reward for anyone that has any additional information. And as of 2019, this case is still ongoing, with DNA and fingerprint evidence being used to try to narrow down the ever wide net of potential subjects of interest and hopefully, hopefully get some closure on a horrible chapter in San Francisco's history. Number two, The Pickler. Now I've talked about The Pickler before on this channel, but his story is so horrifying and honestly unbelievable that it's worth repeating at least once. Again, goes without saying, like every single entry else on this list, The Pickler leads you to believe this is going to be a silly story, but wait about a minute, I'll explain why he's called The Pickler and all the pieces will come together and you'll regret clicking on this video. This one's kind of a dark one. The Pickler's real name was Bella Kiss, and he worked as a tinsmith in the early 1900s, living in a humble small village in Hungary. He had been married, and he had children, but his wife had left, and with her took the children. He moved in a housekeeper who served as his sole faithful companion. His housekeeper would note that he seemed to entertain a plethora of female guests and was never hurting for women's attention, although she didn't talk to any of the guests much. Outside of his women's 
collars. Kiss was actually fairly isolated. He kept to himself mostly. He didn't interact with his neighbors much at all or the community as a whole. Instead, preferring to tend to himself and living quietly alone with his housekeeper and his big collection of metal drums. He had a stockpile of metal drums all over his property, and when people would ask about them, he said that he was stockpiling gas. In 1914, Kiss would be conscripted to serve with the Hungarian army and left behind his home to his noble housekeeper. While deployed, Hungarian soldiers were running low on resources, and when they needed gas, some soldiers on patrol saw fit to take from Kiss's collection all over his property. However, when they went to recover the gas, they were shocked to discover what the barrels actually contained. No gas to be found, but instead the bodies of several missing women floating in alcohol in an attempt to preserve or pickle their corpses. Eh? Yeah, see what I mean? Not pleasant even remotely. There were 20 barrels in total, and inside each one was another missing woman. But perhaps most alarmingly of all of this is that they appeared to have been drained of their bodily fluids with punctures in the neck, which sounds made up. As if this guy wasn't scary enough. Enough, there's also the very real possibility that he might have been a vampire. Now, upon this discovery, the Hungarian army immediately moved to try and locate and apprehend Bella Kiss, but discovered that that would prove quite difficult, since he had both a very common Hungarian name at the time, and he was also deployed in the middle of the largest conflict the world had ever seen at the time, and was just one more face in a green uniform. Somehow, Kiss learned that he was being pursued and faked his death by leaving behind a corpse in a hospital that had his ID. Kiss fled and was never seen in Europe again. A few scattered sightings would report him throughout New York, but he was never found and eluded capture for the remainder of his days. It's unlikely he's still out there, but you never know. And finally, number one, the Zodiac. If we're talking about evil people who've managed to elude capture, it might feel a little obvious to put the Zodiac as number one, you know? But he's also one of the most infamous, strangest, and scariest criminal stories in American history, so it's never a bad story. Well, it, it is. It, it's a terrible story, but it's a very interesting one to hear. The Zodiac terrorized California throughout the late 60s and early 70s, personally claiming responsibility for 37 victims. He stole headlines and media attention for years as the state was fascinated and terrified by what he would do next and if he would ever be caught. His exploits have been the subject of a few films and TV, most famously David Fincher's Zodiac starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Robert Downey Jr. dramatizing the investigation trying to find him unsuccessfully. Although he himself insisted that he left a trail of 37 seven bodies, the police were only ever able to connect five different deaths to the Zodiac. People would be attacked by a lone gunman, with nothing seemingly connecting the cases. Motive, modus, everything was unclear. The case would become legendary when he sent his infamous letters to three separate newspapers, containing details that only the real assailant could have possibly known about the crimes, inviting and challenging police to a game to catch him. He sent out a postcard boldly displaying, my name is, and then a blank spot, with an invitation to solve one of his puzzles. If you saw the new 2022 Batman movie, Paul Dano's Riddler is directly inspired off the Zodiac, all of his methodology, taunting people, leaving weird riddles at his crime scenes, that sort of stuff. His letters were threatening, taunting, and incomprehensible. The code he wrote in would stump detectives for years, to this day, with only one of his ciphers ever being solved, and it not any being nearly enough to connect any dots. The riddle that was solved spelled out a confession of sorts, but it mostly served as the Zodiac gloating about the nature of his crimes and saying that he did it so solely because he thought it was fun and that it was the most thrilling, fun thing a man could do. Described as being better than hunting games or getting your rocks off. He didn't mention whether or not it was better than writing riddles and codes though. Now at the time, obviously they looked into just about everyone they could and there were several prominent suspects and people of interest, but nothing concrete and final. The rest of his riddles were never solved and as far as we know, he was never caught. However, in 2018, a private team of investigators was absolutely determined to close the case once and for all and put an end to one of California's most infamous mysteries. They had identified an 80 year old Gary Francis Post who had passed away. He resembled the composite sketches of the Zodiac and forensic evidence had actually made some compelling arguments that could tie it to being him, but the FBI have denied this claim and say that they still consider the case open. Will it ever be closed within our lifetime? We may never know, but the one thing that's certain is that we are not going to stop trying until we get some answers. You want my theory? Personally, I think Jack the Ripper is the Zodiac. I think that would be the ultimate plot twist to the end of all of this. Number five, Frank Matthews. Our first spot is notorious criminal kingpin Frank Matthews, a legendary crime lord operating out of New York in the 1960s who also had some pretty cool classic mafia names like Pee Wee and Black Caesar, built himself a criminal empire that Los Polos Hermanos would have been jealous of. Starting out small, working in racket 
racketeering and illegal gambling ops in Philly in the 1960s, he had his sights set on much bigger things. Working his way up, collecting numbers, making contacts, until he could start selling product for some serious money. By the early 1970s, he was already trading millions of dollars for illegal narcotics, importing his stuff from Latin America and distributing it throughout the states. Pee Wee had his hands and pockets across the country, with his criminal web spanning across 21 states at its peak. Naturally, if you're moving that much stuff around the country with that many people involved in your operation, eventually somebody's gonna get wise. And that's exactly what happened. Boys in Blue tapped Frankie's phone communications and put out a federal bulletin for his arrest. By December 1972, Frank and his girlfriend were arrested at McCarran International in Vegas. Okay, so he got caught. This kind of breaks the list a little bit, but hear me out a little bit here. Because after spending a paltry couple months in jail, Frankie made bail and quickly got out of Dodge to literally never be seen again. Now, there is some discrepancy as to what happened. The FBI suspects that he was taken care of by a major New York crime family for fears he may turn witness. But they did also post a bounty, a $200,000 bounty for finding him, so they suspected he might still be out there. No trace of him was ever found, no body ever discovered, and his story went cold. Is he sleeping with the fishes, or did he return to pull strings from the shadows? Or maybe he pulled a Saul Goodman and started managing a Cinnabon in Omaha, living life on the lamb. Man, that's, that's two Breaking Bad references in one point. I gotta spread them out a little bit more. We got lots more than awkwardly wedging in Breaking Bad references on Top 5 Scary. We've got the best horror content on the web at least twice a day, every day. So hit subscribe and stay spooked. Number 4, The Pickler. You know, at first glance, this is not a particularly threatening nickname. It kind of sounds like the absolute lamest Z-tier excuse for a Batman villain that you'd throw in as a warm-up before, you know, fighting the actual cool villain of that issue. Well, names can often be so deceiving because there really is not a lot that's funny about the Pickler once you understand why they called him that. He's maybe one of the most bizarre and macabre criminals I've ever read about. The Hungarian Bella Kiss lived in a small village near Budapest in the early 20th century. He lived with an elderly maid but otherwise kept to himself, didn't have a tight circle of friends, but he did enjoy frequent female company. I mean, of course, with a name like Bella Kiss. Makes sense. I, I gotta stop trying to make this guy sound cute because I'm gonna regret it in like one second. In 1914, during the height of the First World War, Bella left to fight with his country. Now, wartime sometimes necessitates borrowing resources wherever you can, and the Hungarian army was short on gas. On Bella's isolated property were dozens upon dozens of oil barrels all conspicuously laid out in his yard. Someone alerted the soldiers and they went to go borrow a cup or two, and were shocked to discover that upon cracking open the barrels were the bodies of several women floating in alcohol in a depraved attempt to preserve the corpses, hence where the foul nickname The Pickler came from. See, it's, it's not nearly as funny once you know why they call them that. 20 barrels. 20 missing women. That's somehow not even the scariest, craziest part of this whole story. The women had punctures in their necks and were drained of blood, which sounds completely made up that this guy might also have been a vampire. Now, the Hungarian army moved to seize Bella immediately, but tracking him proved rather difficult, as he had a fairly common name and was also, you know, he was in a war. Somehow, Bella was alerted that police had discovered his operation, and he left a corpse posing as himself in a military hospital and fled never to be found again. Reported sightings popped up for a few years here and there. Allegedly, he moved to New York to begin a new life, but Bella eluded capture for the rest of his life. Unless he really was a vampire and is still out there, but I don't even want to entertain that possibility. Number three, D.B. Cooper. Now, our next entry, I would hesitate to call him as evil as the rest of some of these crooks, you know? Sure, he hijacked a plane. Sure, he held the entire plane hostage. And sure, he stole $200,000 from the government, but that doesn't mean he's a bad guy. D. B. Cooper's case is one of contemporary crime legends, as all that I just described sounds like he would be FBI public enemy number one, right? Like they'd be working around the clock to bust this guy, they'd have him within the week. He slipped through authorities' fingers, and to date, D.B. Cooper was never caught. We don't know if that was even his real name, or just an epithet he was using for the plane. We don't know anything really too concrete about him. Depending on what your definition of success is, D.B. Cooper could possibly be considered one of the most successful criminals of all time. To get into the nitty gritty of the details, on November 24th, 1971, a man, using the possible alias Dan Cooper, boarded a flight to Seattle. And almost as soon as it took off, he passed a note to a flight attendant indicating that he had a with him, and that he demanded that when the plane land, he trade the passengers on the flight for $200,000 and two parachutes. That's a smart man. He didn't want to waste any of that money on parachutes. The note said that if anything funny happened, he would blow the plane up. 
They complied out of fear, and upon landing, he was given the money by local authorities. Cooper then seized the plane one more time, holding the flight crew hostage with plans to fly to Mexico City. But midway through the flight, Cooper pulled a little point break and jumped out of the plane with all the money with him. And that would be the last time anyone would have ever seen D.B. Cooper. The FBI chased him for years to no avail. Nothing was ever found, no body ever recovered, no suspects ever caught out of a laundry list of people of interest. Some of the the bills were recovered, but that's the only piece of evidence. Now, my absolute favorite theory about D.B. Cooper, and it's kind of out there, is that he's legendary cinema director Tommy Wiseau, and that this is where his fortune came from, as the man is shrouded in mystery regarding where his seemingly limitless supply of money comes from and his mysterious origins. Is it completely ridiculous and has no basis in reality? Yes, but it's also hilarious. Now, as for any more likely suspects for Cooper, there were a couple of special forces veterans who lined up with physical descriptions who could have been capable of committing the heist. But no concrete charges were ever made, and to date, no trace was ever found. Number two, the Zodiac. Possibly one of the most infamous cases in American history, the Zodiac was a notorious criminal, famed in equal measures for his slayings and for his chilling obsession and interaction with the police trying to track him. He was made a household name after a Hollywood flick starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Robert Downey Jr. depicting the efforts trying to find him. The Zodiac is known to be responsible for five different deaths terrorizing California in the late 60s and early 70s, although he himself claims responsibility for 37 victims. The Zodiac case became legend when he sent his now infamous letters to three separate newspapers, providing details only he could have known about the crimes, and challenging the police to a sick game of sorts, sending them incomprehensible ciphers and riddles that supposedly contained clues to his identity and the crimes within. Only one of his ciphers was ever solved and the rest remain a mystery. The uh, Riddler from the new Batman movie is a direct inspiration from the Zodiac's sinister dealings. For five years, the Zodiac would taunt his pursuers with riddles and codes, sending horrifying cards, taunts, a, a letter boldly displaying my name is blank, and then a cipher below it teasing their inability to find him, a postcard with his symbol written in blood amongst others. Part of what makes the Zodiac such a fascinating and truly horrifying case is how much he seems like a movie bad guy come to life. The planning makes him out to be some sort of sinister criminal mastermind, and it's hard to disagree with that proclamation when he's completely eluded any form of capture for the better part of 50 years. There were several possible suspects as to who the Zodiac could have been, but nothing conclusive. To date, people are still trying to find the answer, hoping something new might come up to put that nightmare to rest. And number one, Jack the Ripper. If you want to talk about evil that's got some staying power, it's hard to top Whitechapel's most infamous resident ever, 134 years avoiding capture, which means he could still be out there. The 18th century Night Stalker has held an almost supernatural-like grip over public interest since we first ever heard about the case, surrounding the brutal five slayings we know about, who knows how many more. Preying on women and using the cover of the night, Jack eluded, stupefied, and taunted the streets of London, leaving a disgusting trail of blood and gore in his wake, leaving victims looking like the aftermath of a butcher's. He seemed to take a sickening glee in his violent delights, mocking his would-be pursuers, sending the police threatening letters and even organs from his crimes. Jack is an almost modern mythical boogeyman, appearing across hundreds upon hundreds of works of fiction, TV shows, movies, video games, you name it. Assassin's Creed even tried to say he was part of the order. That's a little out there. There are some folk who offer that Jack the Ripper is the progenitor to all true crime fascination, which honestly kind of makes sense. As much as he terrified Londoners at the time, the media was obsessed with him, with the original media buzz surrounding him, paralleling how we talk about most brutal crimes these days. You can bet your bottom pounds that if Jack was terrorizing London today, there'd be podcasters talking about him in between sponsored ads for me undies. Jack's crimes shocked Londoners, as the vicious and public nature of the slayings were not exactly commonplace. So surely, in 130 years, someone had to have, have some idea as to who Mr. The Ripper was, right? But with a case as famous as this, obviously there are some options. A quick glance at Jack's Wikipedia page suggests a possible 31 different suspects over the years who've all been attributed to it. And those are just the ones who made the page. It's worth noting that we are still looking. We are still trying to find him. Put this case to rest. Because everyone wants to be the one to say they unmasked The Ripper. Number five on this list is Edward Edwards. Edward Edwards, for those who don't know, was an American serial killer who did most of his killing from 1977 to 1996. He has five confirmed kills to his name, however he's suspected of several additional murders that were never solved. Edward always had an affinity to crime. 
1955, he actually escaped from jail and went around America robbing gas stations and was at large for seven years. He became so well known that he actually earned a spot on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list at the time. He also refused to disguise himself during these robberies because he claimed that he wanted to become famous. Eventually, in 1962, he was found and brought in. He was sent to jail, but didn't actually spend too long there considering what he had already done. He was out on parole in 1967, which, as we'll later learn, was a horrible idea. The first known murders that Edward committed were in 1977 when he killed William Lavico and his girlfriend Judith Straub. They were both very young and he took them out into the woods and shot them both with a shotgun. Three years after this incident, he murdered two people again. This time, the victims were named Tim Hack and Kelly Drew, and instead of being shot, they were stabbed and strangled. Then in 1996 was his last confirmed murder, that of Danny Law Glockner. This was actually Edward's foster son, and he admitted to killing him for the life insurance policy of $250,000. In an interview, Edward very matter-of-factly owns up to killing Danny and shows zero remorse at all. He goes on to say that he was a schemer, and he'd always been a schemer, and was looking for a way to earn a quick buck. He said that he had planned this thing for over a year and had been preparing everything for that long. In the interview, he very carefully lays out everything that happened and does it in a manner that it seems as if he's almost boasting about it. He even talks about how he took his head and threw it into a forest a year later after animals had bitten it off and he doesn't even blink. Edward Edwards was an extremely sick and twisted man who clearly was not capable of feeling any normal and healthy human emotions. He died in prison back in 2011. Number four on this list is Tommy Lynn Sells. Tommy Lynn Sells is right up there as being one of the worst serial killers of all time. The acts that he committed were so gruesome and just plain evil that I can't even begin to understand the level of inhumanity that it would have taken to do it. He was only convicted for one murder, which he received the death penalty for, but authorities believe that he committed upwards of 22. Tommy Lynn Sells was known for murdering mothers and their he didn't just stop with them though, also killing the fathers from time to time, but there was definitely a bit of a pattern involved with the mothers. In an interview that he had while he was still alive, he comes up with a sick and twisted reason as to why he did this. I know what I went through as a child. The nightmares, the, the, the drama, the reality of, of who I was and, and what was done to me. I never wanted that to happen to another person. Tommy Lynn Sells argues that he killed children to put them out of their misery. I, I don't even know if there are adjectives in the English language to describe how messed up that is. Tommy Lynn Sells was eventually executed on April 3rd, 2014. Number three on this list is Bernard Giles. Bernard Giles is currently serving several life imprisonments for killing five between September and November of 1973. He was only 21 years old when he committed these crimes and had a wife and a child at the time. He would get in his vehicle and drive around on highways looking for young women who needed a lift. These hitchhikers would get into his car and before they knew what was happening, Bernard would strike. In the clip that I'm about to show you, Bernard is far older. A lot of years have passed since he's been imprisoned, but here he tries to recount his first killings. That day that you went out when you did kill for the first time, was that a morning when you woke up and you were with your wife and daughter and you just, something hit you and you went, no, today may be the day? Every day may be the day. Every day? Every day may be the day. So there are multiple things about that clip which makes it one of the most chilling to me. I think what really gets me though is how he talks about every day being the possible day. Literally at any point without warning, these serial killers could snap and then go on a rampage. And they don't even remember who it was that they killed. At least we know that Bernard Giles will be spending the rest of his existence locked behind bars. Number one on this list is Manuel Vela. The crimes committed by Manuel Vela actually happened not too long ago, which makes this whole story that much more scary. Manuel was a 28 year old man who only a few years ago killed his girlfriend who was 39 weeks pregnant with his child. Like guys, we are talking about just some of the most sick and twisted stuff ever. 
After he was finally apprehended, an interview took place. In that interview, he says that the only reason he was with his girlfriend all this time was to eventually kill her, and he had told her this time and time again. Why did you stay with her? Oh, to kill her. So that was your only purpose this whole time? Yes, yeah, kill her. And you made it pretty clear to her that that was your whole purpose as well? Yeah. I told everybody, hey, I'm, you, you, I'm gonna kill you, right? I'm gonna kill her. So apparently this guy had been telling her about this for years and was planning it this whole time. This is just some insane stuff that is honestly hard to break down. I have no idea how anyone could get to this place or what would cause something like this. Manuel Vela ended up taking his own life in January 2017. Number five. John Wayne Gacy. John Wayne Gacy is one of America's most infamous criminal cases. He's practically single-handedly responsible for traumatizing an entire generation into a fear of clowns. A vicious sadist and a remorseless criminal, hearing clips of him talk is deeply disturbing. In a series of interviews in 1992, Mr. Gacy offered a rare window into the mind of a lunatic. In the interviews, Gacy is adamant that he is innocent of his crimes and talks in a remarkably pleasant, almost affable way. He seems like an average Joe, a, a chatty old man that you would probably talk to it a park or something until little cracks in the facade keep appearing and its darkness comes out. He appears to be talking himself in circles. At one point, it seems like he indirectly confesses to something he claimed that he hadn't, and when the interviewer presses him on it, he retracts like a child being caught in a lie, saying, I'm sorry if I led you to believe that. In the same interview, the reporter asks Gacy to show him the rope trick, the horrifying method of strangulation Gacy would use on his victims by applying a tourniquet. Gacy obliges, but when the reporter hands him the string, he chuckles wryly and says, aren't you scared sitting next to me? Most chilling is when the subject changes to talk of his clowning. He seems like he genuinely loved it, and knowing the unspeakable acts he committed as a clown makes it all the more sinister. He talks about how to him, clowning was an act of regression. It allowed him to explore his inner child within. Deeply, deeply unsettling. Perhaps most upsetting though, is hearing Gacy talk about his anger towards his victim's family, saying they're overreacting. And you realize everything about the persona you've seen in the interviews is all just an act, just more makeup. 